لقد خلقنا الانسان في احسن تكوين indeed we created humans in the best form are we really the best form and if you look at various aspects of our body for example if you look at our eyes comparing our eyes to various other creatures our eyes are like 576 megapixel resolution this is estimated where a bird has three times more powerful eyes than us they can see more clearly they can see further distance they can fly hundreds of feet high in the air and some of them have binocular eyes they can actually zoom into the ground and see a mouse hiding behind some grass so they have more powerful eyes than us many of the creatures have more powerful than eyes than us so we don't have the best eyes then why are we being called the best form by the way, our eyes are not that bad. If you compare with what we have been able to build, the highest resolution camera we have been able to build is 400 megapixel, and that costs nearly 44,000 pound. And we have 576 megapixel resolution eyes, and we have two of them. And how much did we pay for our eyes? Nothing. <laughs> then if you compare with our other organs like you know, hearing and smell, dogs can hear much larger spectrum of sounds up to 65,000 hertz where we can hear up to 20,000 hertz so we don't have the best eyes ears either and smelling you know they have 10,000 times better smell than us so you know why are we the best form we don't seem to have the best organs uh, but uh, alhamdulillah we don't have 10,000 times better smell imagine being able to smell everyone in the room thousand times more intensely that was good that we don't have that level of smell then if you look at uh, muscle strength, you know, a gorilla would have strength of at least nine of this guy. Uh, I think it's probably not a fair comparison. Let's do a fair comparison. <laughs> so you know, a gorilla would have at least five times strength of this famous person. So we, are, we don't have even a strong body either, yet we are called the uh, best form. If you look at our you know, lower strength, a cat can outrun Usain Bolt. So you know, we don't have even strong legs either. You know, still we are called the best form for some reason and we'll figure out why that is. I don't know why this slide is there, but okay. So let's look at this verse. Uh, why is the word taqween there? You know, a more familiar word would be, uh, for example, shakal, which means physical form or surah, which generally means some form. Allah didn't use any of these very familiar words. He used a strange word, taqween which comes in the entire Quran only once. So we can't even look at other verses to see what taqweem could refer to. And I looked into more than 40 tafsirs explanation of this verse to understand why the word taqweem is there. You know, most of the tafsir will say taqweem just means surah, you know, ahsanu surah, best form, uh, afdalu surah, the most favorable form. Some even say it, it's taadilu surah, like the most balanced form. So they are all saying that it means form. But I found seven tafsir who wrote about something very interesting. They are saying that taqweem has to do with the upright straight figure of the human body. And taqweem can also sometimes mean a fine-tuned body, something that is in perfect moderation. So when you look at the dictionaries, classical Arabic dictionary, you will also see the meaning of the word taqweem comes as making something upright straight. So taqweem indicates something to do with our straight body. And if you look at the, uh, you know, compared to them, we do have a very straight body and our body is very purposely designed to be straight from our shoulder, our neck, to our ribs, lower part, you know, knee, legs, even the nervous systems, all of them are very specifically designed to give us this straight body. So there must be a big purpose why we have been fine-tuned to be a straight uh, figure. Being upright gives us a couple of advantages. First is that we have energy efficient walking. You know, we can walk long distances spending little energy. You know, here you can see the chimp is walking over four legs and that is more energy expensive than just walking over two legs. And you will see when the chimp will eventually stand up and walk, you know, it looks like it has come from the pub. There is a lot of unnecessary movement and that are wasting energy while our body has the absolute minimum of movement required to walk and also maintain the balance of the body. And the benefit of having an energy efficient walking is that we now can spend our energy to more higher function. Energy gets diverted to our brain, which we can then use for uh, social interaction, hunting, gathering. So the energy is now diverted for more higher functions. We don't need to spend too much energy just for walking.
there was a research done to measure exactly how, uh, how much calorie <coughs> monkeys spend versus humans spend. Monkeys spend nearly double the calorie uh, for walking. So if you give an example, if a monkey eats a plate of chicken biryani, let's say it will be able to walk 50 kilometers. If we eat the same amount of chicken biryani, we will be able to walk 100 kilometers. So that's how efficient we are. And this means that we have to consume less food to get our job done. And that advantage came from our straight figure. Takwim gave us that advantage. You know, nowadays we don't walk much. You know, we sit at home, then get out of home, sit in a car, get out of car, sit in a chair. So we don't have to spend much energy in walking. But for most part of the human civilization, we had to walk a lot to get our job done. We needed an energy efficient body to become a civilized creature. And, and Takwim gave us that straight figure, gave us that energy benefit. <clears throat> Now, by the way, you know, we do not appreciate what an incredible ability walking on two feet is. You know, in the last decades, the robotics industry have spent billions of dollars to make robots walk like us. You know, and this is the best they have achieved so far. And you can appreciate it's quite hard to walk on different terrains and still maintain the balance of your body. You know, this is the result of billions of dollars of investment. And Allah gave us this ability for free. You know, we have it free. We don't realize it. We realize it when we lose it. We really realize it when we lose our ability to walk. And a big benefit for being able to walk on two feet is that our hands are free. So we can use our hands to carry objects, use tools while we are walking. And in many villages, you will see mothers carry their children you know, while working in farms. So, uh, and they can even carry heavy loads between their home and their fields. You know, being able to walk and at the same time use our hands really helped us as a species to develop for example agriculture get better at using tools doing various jobs that needs hands and being able to walk at the same time it was only possible because of our fine-tuned straight design of our body this guy shows how amazing our body's engineering is <laughs> look at what he's able to do imagine if he had whole one of the knives in the Sharp, and if he catches that, you know, instant A and E, six hours waiting. <laughs> so, you know, th this shows you that how incredibly fine tuned our body is that we are able to do something like this. No other creature will be able to ever do anything like this. And now, having our hands free, you know, while walking and running was key to our success as a species because for most part of our history, we had to rely on hunting as a main source of our food. Agriculture was developed much, much later. So hunting was only possible because we were able to run and use weapons at the same time. And being able to use weapons with our hands triggered a kind of technological development as well. Uh, human civilization wanted to develop more and more powerful hunting tools. The other benefit is that you know, hunting contributes very significantly to economy. Even in a country like United States, contributes nearly $25 billion. So you would, you would think that maybe in poor African countries and Asian countries, hunting would be a major contributor to their economy. But even a country like US benefits so much from hunting. There are two more benefits for having a straight body. You know, firstly, we can release heat from our body more efficiently while we are walking and running, much more efficiently than apes. And the other benefit is that we don't need full body far to protect our body from the sun's rays. We just need a little bit of thick fur here, and that's it, more or less, our body is protected from, from the sun. So this straight figure eliminated the need to have a full body fur covering to protect our body from sun's heats. Imagine if we had thick fur all over our body, how would we have looked? I use an AI to generate how a, a human looks like when we have a full body fur. Prepare yourself for what you are about to see. <laughs> this, this is how we would have looked at it. Imagine how much time we would have spent shampooing and drying our fur in the entire body. And doing udu on this body would be very, very difficult. And also, what would happen when the lice season comes? That would be very interesting. Now, strangely, I found some scientists uh, writing articles and getting published in top journals that Look, we don't have far the natural protection from suns, rays, cold, parasites, fungus, bacteria. You know, this is a big mistake in God's design. That's what they're claiming. Would anyone of you want to like have, have a body like this? You know, <laughs> I think if you do a yoga poll, everyone will say, no, thank you. I'm perfectly happy with my body. 
Because sometimes scientists make these claims, sounds very logical, but when you really think deeply, you realize that it's insanity. Uh, Alhamdulillah, no, Allah didn't give us this full body fur. <laughs> you know, Takubi uh, removed the need to have a, a full body fur, and now we have this beautiful far free body. Uh, now, something to think about is that our cousins, primates, st still have thick body fur. And it's one of the mystery in biology and especially in evolution is that why suddenly humans lost all the fur while still all the other primates still have them. You know, if evolution was really true, we should still have the, the natural protection because that gives us an advantage as a, as a species. At least we should have fur on our shoulders that get direct sun rays and we get sunburn. You know, the, if evolution was really true, we should have at least fur in this part of our body, but we don't. For some reason, fur has been removed from our entire body and only just kept in our head. You know, this, uh, this alone is a big challenge to the theory of evolution. You know, scientists cannot explain why humans suddenly have no fur and others still have it. You know, we know from Wahi that Allah wants us to be clothed. You know, fur has been replaced with clothing. A simple fact that many people outside seem to have difficulty realizing nowadays. And in Surah Araf, verse number uh, 26, Allah tells us that uh, we sent down clothing upon you. Literally, clothing has been sent down upon us. Uh, it's possible that there has been some divine intervention on the first human that clothing was sent down to them. Or it's possible that maybe the raw materials for clothing like um, cotton, leather, those were sent down via some divine intervention so uh, humankind could be build clothing for them. At least this verse is telling us that clothing is not a human in invention, which is what historians claim. Historians claim that early men were naked and later on they invented clothing. No, Allah is telling us that from the very first human, clothing was there. It was Allah himself who sent down clothing for us. You know, there is a powerful phrase here, the garment of taqwa is the best of all garments. And Allah wants us to wear garment that shows our uh, our taqwa of him. You know, the best garment is the garment that makes the statement, look, I have taqwa of Allah, I'm not here to get your attention. That's the best garment. Now, going back to the topic of you know, heat efficiency, what is the benefit of having a heat efficient body? The first benefit is that we become awesome at running. And let me show you how good we are. You know, this is, we have a superpower that very few people know about. Cheetahs are the fastest land animal in the world. But did you know that humans can leave them in the dust? At least in the long run. That's right. When it comes to endurance, we can outrun wolves, cheetahs, and even horses. Now, in the, be in the beginning, humans fall short because we're lousy sprinters. Case in point, Usain Bolt couldn't outrun a cheetah in the 100 meter dash if he wanted to. And he tried. But marathons and ultramarathons are a whole other ball game. Each year, a small town in Wales holds the Man vs. Horse Marathon. It's a 22-mile race between riders on horseback and runners. And while horses often win, humans will sometimes prevail. So what makes humans such endurance-running superstars? The secret weapon is our sweat. We have 2-4 to four million sweat glands all over our body, which means we can run and cool ourselves at the same time. Having no fur is also a huge plus. In contrast, dogs rely on panting to cool down, and other animals, like horses and camels, also sweat, but less effectively. As a result, they overheat faster and must slow down sooner. The mechanics of our running stride also makes us particularly well-suited for endurance running. So that's a big benefit of having a heat-efficient body, that we are able to run and walk, and also at the same time, cool our body. Now, uh, you know, this reminds when I was looking at this, our ability to walk a very long distance, this reminded me of uh, this incident from Sira. Uh, remember when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and Abu Bakr had to leave overnight and do a hijrah because there was an assassination attempt on the Prophet? So, uh, Prophet left Ali on, on his bed and Ali had to settle various dealings. And after a couple of days, he walked from Makkah to Medina. You know, Makkah to Medina on foot is nearly 547 kilometers. And Ali Radhatan was able to walk that distance on his own. 
Now this shows that what an incredibly efficient body we have that we can walk more than 500 kilometers just carrying in whatever amount of uh, water and food we can carry on our back. You know, th there are five brothers who tried to have the same experience. They walked from Mecca to Medina. They wanted to have the same feeling of uh, Prophet Hijra. And they were able to do it just wearing Iran. <laughs> just imagine that 547 kilometers they walked. And all of this ability, this extreme endurance, heat efficiency, being able to walk and run long distance, all came from this Aquim straight figure that we have. You know, finally, on this topic of straight body, you know, there is this project called the Genographic Project. You can actually give your DNA sample and they will trace your ancestry from where they have come from. So scientists looked into human DNA to trace where our ancestors came from. Uh, they found that the first human likely to have come from somewhere in Africa in that region. And then humans spread into Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And eventually humans spread, went to Europe, Asia, crossed all over Russia, went to North America and then eventually South America. And if you look at this ayah, wa min min turabi thumma idantum basharun that uh, one of Allah's sign is that He created mankind and then mankind spread all over the planet. And Allah is inviting us to reflect on that. How was that possible? There are many, many amazing things about that. How human beings were able to spread all over the planet. Now, I'll conclude on this topic that Allah has gifted us with a much improved design than the primates. Takuim is literally the pinnacle of engineering excellence. But we have been regressing ourselves back into the monkey form, you know, hunching over computers and play shaitan four and five for hours and hours, you know, damaging our posture, the suffering from neck pain, back pain, hip pain, leg pain, knee pain, so many pains are there because of you know, we, we have corrupted our form. You know, we need to really rewind ourselves and go back to the straight form, the finest form we had. By the way, I don't think that I'm endorsing evolution in any way, but usually this type of picture is used to talk about evolution, but of course I'm not supporting evolution in any way. Now let's look at our hands. You know, our hands don't get much of a media coverage. Our brain seems to get all the credit. But I'll show you that our hands made us what we are. And here, here we will see another aspect of the queen, fine tuning, perfect design or perfect adjustment. Our hands has a unique feature which is called the opposable thumb. Now it means that we can use our thumb to touch our fingertips. No one else can do that. The other thing we can do is that we can fold our fingers and then lock with our thumb. This gives us a very strong grip. No one else can do that. You know? This means that we can use tools very efficiently that uh, no other primates can do. And, and this highly balanced design and you know, having a thumb like this that are able to connect with all our digits and all our fingertips. This actually allowed us to use many tools that propelled our development as a human being. If I show you the comparison with Gorilla Hand, Gorilla has this, <laughs> what a tiny little thumb, what it does with that thumb. And the chimpanzee thumb is so far away from its fingers that it cannot form that uh, strong lock that we can. And, and now because of our perfectly balanced design of our fingers and our thumb, we can use so many different tools and these tools, you know, helped us flourish as a technologically advanced civilization. If we didn't have thumb, which is designed like this, we wouldn't have uh, modern construction, electronics, computers, nothing. Allah gave us the best design hand in the animal kingdom. And it really helped us to become a technologically advanced species. And it's so significant that I found this quote from Sir Isaac Newton. He's saying that, the thumb alone would convince him of God's existence. And he has really thought about it. Uh, he, he wasn't really a believer at the beginning, but then he started looking at human body's design and concluded that this thumb is enough to prove there is a God. And our thumb, uh, you know, we are the only creature who can do this. You know, no, no other creature on the planet will be able to do this. And it's all because of our thumbs. You know, no monkey can use chopsticks, that's for sure. Even I can't use chopsticks. I don't know if I'm stuck at evolution and you all can, but yeah, I mean, this is a very, very difficult thing that only this hand can do. The other benefit is that you know, we are the only creature who has the ability to do this. If you really think about it, what's going on here, we are able to use our thumbs at a very high resolution. We can pinpoint and touch a small area, exactly the area that we want, three times a second, 100 times a minute. And it needs a very specially designed thumb to be able to do something like this. 
And Allah has given us this perfect thumb. We were able to use it like this, WhatsApp you, and you all come here and learn about thumb. And you know, this helped mankind to perform highly intelligent functions you know, like this. We are becoming more and more intelligent with our thumbs. All right. Uh, now let's address some of the popular claims out there where scientists are claiming that there are flaws in human body's design. There is a group of scientists whose job is to you know, write so many papers, uh, published, even gets published in top journals. If you can write about human body's flaw, it's the best way to get published in top journals. It doesn't have to be factually correct, just write it you know, in a convincing way. They're claiming that there are many flaws in human body's design. I'll show you some of the popular ones. You know, one of the claims are that why is there one pipe for breathing and eating? Because of this, we have choking. Isn't this a wrong design? Let me show you an animation how we swallow. Deglutition is the process by which food passes from the mouth through the pharynx and into the esophagus. As simple as it might seem to healthy people, swallowing is actually a very complex action that requires an extremely precise coordination with breathing, since both of these processes share the same entrance, the pharynx. Failure to coordinate would result in choking or pulmonary aspiration. So they're claiming that you know, if you look at the statistics of choking, one child dies every five days because of choking. This is pretty difficult statistics to digest, isn't it? You know, thousands of people dying from choking every year. They're saying that this is a big flaw in human body's design. You know, no intelligent creator would design anything like this. But that's what they're claiming. Now, let's see, you know, what, what they say would be a better design. They're claiming that there should have been two different pipes. One pipe going from nose to our lungs and a totally separate pipe going from our mouth to our stomach. So there will be one for breathing that goes directly to the lungs and another pipe for only eating that is connected to our stomach. Yeah. Now what would happen if your nose gets blocked? You know you have hay fever season, your nose are blocked. You'll die because you cannot breathe through your mouth anymore. Your mouth is connected to your stomach. So this better design would mean that every year half of the population will, will disappear. And then similarly, you know, uh, uh, what if our mouth gets blocked and we will not be able to eat through our nose? At least today, doctors can put pipes through our nose and feed us in case our mouth is blocked. But in this design, we will not be able to feed us through our nose either. So what we need is redundancy. You know, we need at least two different breathing passages. If one is blocked, the other is still there for breathing. And we need two different food passages. If one is blocked, the other is there for eating. Now let's see if what happens if that is the case. You know, this is Allah's beautiful and efficient design. This is how we would look if scientists had the job to design our face. <laughs> now besides looking weird, the amount of complexity is introduced here. We have four organs. That means that we need to have a much larger head to accommodate four organs. And that means we need to have much larger neck to hold that heavy head. We need much larger shoulder to hold that heavy upper part. Now our upper part of the body is so heavy that we need a big tail to balance our body. Or we need like elephant like big legs to balance us. You know, such a big heavy creature would have little energy to divert to their brain and will not be able to use their brain at capacity and that creature would also be quite slow to move. You know, it will be a very inefficient design. We will become a very energy hungry design as well. We'll have to eat continuously throughout the day. And all of that complexity is solved by this one clever engineering. Put a valve on top of the air pipe. That's it. All of the complexity is gone. You know, that's the incredible engineering excellence you, know, you see in Allah's design. And let's talk about another uh, so-called mistake in human body that are claimed by scientists. This is about the appendix. You know, we have this appendix hanging from our intestine. Even 20 years ago, in medical books and encyclopedias, used to call this appendix as a vestige organ, means unnecessary organ. Scientists used to claim that this is a mistake from or leftover from evolution. This has no purpose. If you surgically remove it, we are still perfectly fine. So, you know, this shows that Evolution is true and there have been some mistake in evolution. There is really no intelligent creator designing our body. 
But a decade ago, researchers found that this was a big misconception. An appendix helps in proper movement of waste matter in our intestine. And also it helps our immune system. Whenever there are new germs that get introduced into our intestine, this appendix has a reservoir of antibodies that goes and helps control that sudden increase in germs in our intestine. And that's why you have appendix yeah, getting infected when there have been too many germs got into our intestine. Another research paper shows that an appendix helps develop immune system in fetus and young adults. And in adults, appendix is involved in a very important immune function. It's one of the organ that helps our intestine keep healthy. Now what happened is that because of all the wrong claims that scientists made and things were written in medical books that this is an organ that is unnecessary, you know, many indiscriminate surgeries have happened, appendixes were removed indis indiscriminately and that has resulted in quite a bit of complexity later on as well. And another wrong claim was about the tonsils. You, know, you have tonsils on both sides of our throat and we have adenoids at the back of the nose wall. Now, even two decades ago, the medical textbooks and encyclopedias used to call tonsil adenoids as useless organ, you know, vestige organ. You can easily surgically remove them and you have still no problem. And because of that, you know, a lot of indiscriminate uh, surgery has happened. Uh, recent research have found that the tonsils and adenoids play actually a very important role in our immune system. They are the first line of defense of the microbes that go through our mouth and through our nose. You know, the air that we breathe in is full of microbes, funguses, bacteria, viruses, dust, so many uh, harmful things are going through our nose and through our mouth. These tonsils and adenoids are the first line of defense because they get rubbed through those. You know, whatever we inhale, the air gets rubbed through our adenoids and our food gets rubbed through our tonsils and that's when the immune system kicks in. They get an idea that what is getting inside our body. So they start taking preparation that they have to defend our body against that. If, if we don't have this, that means that a lot of harmful things are going into our lungs, into our stomach. Now, here's an extract from two research paper I found. One was published back in 2000. Uh, showing that the adenoids and tonsils are really an important part of our immune system and something that came out recently in 2020 is that you know they are our first line defense against respiratory inf infection. So you see you know scient scientists can sometimes make big mistakes. They can mislead the medical professionals in doing surgeries that actually cause long-term harm. And after studying all, all of these you know, things I, I realized something from the Soral mode there is a verse which where Allah says that, you know, we cannot see any imperfection in the creation of most merciful. You know, look, see any flaws? You look again, your vision will return exhaust and failing. No matter how many times people try to find flaws in human body's design, they all get disproved. You know, there is no imperfection. You know, tafawut is imperfection and futur, any flaws in, in Allah's design. Everything is perfectly balanced. Now I'll show you two totally mind-blowing stuff. You know, they will help you appreciate the genius of Allah. You know, scientists cannot explain how these two things are possible in the nature. Not these two, <laughs> I think what I will show you will require a lot of thinking. I'm thinking that maybe you, know, you need some small break, five minutes or shall I continue? Continue? Good enough? All right. Okay, let's look at our fingertips. If you zoom in, now these are the creases in the fingertips. You can already start seeing the cells. If you zoom in, you can actually see the cells in our body. And let's go inside our cells. And inside the cell, you will see the nucleus at the center. And once we go through the nucleus, you will see what is inside the nucleus. You know, this is the chromosome. Chromosome is essentially a densely packed strand of DNA. And when you, you know, extract the chromosome, you see this long DNA strand. This looks like a coil and you have these four colors. These are essentially four different types of molecules. The, for convenience, scientists show them as different colors. So that's our DNA. You know, when you look at a DNA, there are four different types of essentially molecules if, if I simplify it. Uh, scientists have given them specific letters to easily uh, identify them, A, C, T, G. These are four different molecules that are part of our DNA. 
Now these molecules are used to store specific code in our DNA. You know, if I give an analogy, in computers we write codes in English language and then the code gets converted into a binary language of zeros and ones. So computers only understand, the computer machine will only understand zeros and ones. Zero means low voltage, one means high voltage. You know, everything that computer stores in their memory, all the calculation, everything a computer is doing is based on this zero and one language. Now Allah has used this four letter language to store all the information in the DNA. In the entire human DNA, there are 3.2 billion letter codes stored in there. You know, this code tells cells how to make a human body. From one cell, you get an entire human body. Because the entire human body's design is stored in this DNA in 3.2 billion letter code. And not just design, how to grow, how to repair injuries, how to heal from diseases, you know, eventually degrade our organs and one day die. All of that code is stored into our DNA in this 3.2 billion letter code. And to, to help you appreciate how big that code is, this entire code of 3.2 billion letters have been printed in books. It takes 130 such books to hold this 3.2 billion letter code. And these books are like 1,000 page thick, each of them, these thick books. Uh, I think University of Leicester has, has a complete printout of the uh, human genome. And anyone trying to read the entire human genome code, it will take 95 years to finish it. All of that code is stored in a single cell in, in DNA and every single cell in our body have this exact code stored there. This is how the real code looks like, you know, maybe a part of this code defines what your skin color would be, another part could define uh, what resistance you will have to various diseases, another part could define what condition you will develop as you grow up or what disabilities you will have. You know, almost like a part of your color is written in this code. And this is Allah's code, no human intervention here. You know, Allah has made this language of four letter code and he has himself written this vast amount of code, a 3.2 billion letter length code stored in our DNA. It's all his writing, no intervention, human intervention here. Every cell in your, in your body carries Allah's signature. You know, this is his language. And how, how efficient DNA is as a storage of data mechanism. Scientists have been exploring ways to store data in DNA because DNA surprisingly is very durable. It can last hundreds of years without data getting corrupted in it. And some scientists in a Tianjin University was able to store a picture and a video uh, in, a, in a yeast DNA. And they have come up with a very interesting statistics that they found that DNA can store nearly 10 million times more data that we can store in our current SD cards or our hard disk. That's how powerful DNA is as a storage mechanism. And to help you understand how much data DNA can store, let's take an analogy that the total data that we have today, mankind has so far produced, it's about 180 zettabytes. I won't explain what that is. I think there are too many terms already. So it's a huge amount of data. If we develop a way to store data in DNA, we will be able to store entire world's data into a cup full of DNA. That's how efficient DNA is as a data storage mechanism. You know, when Allah builds something, it's always mind boggling. Entire world's worth of data can be stored in just a couple of handful of DNA. <laughs> I have this cat coming up a couple of times, so excuse me. And two more amazing things about DNA that will make you appreciate really the genius of Allah. Now, you see DNA has two threads, one here and one down there. You know, sometimes a part of the DNA gets corrupted or broken. You know, nature is a tough place. It's difficult to keep 3.2 billion letters code intact all the time. You know, th things get lost, things get broken, things get corrupted. So what happens when a part of your DNA is lost? You know, is your whole body getting corrupted now when you start developing cancer cells? No, actually DNA has the ability to repair itself. And it's possible because of a very clever logic that Allah has put in place. The logic Allah has put in place is that the molecule A can only connect with the molecule T on the other side and the molecule G can only connect with the molecule C on the other side. Using this simple algorithm, you can look at one part of the DNA and reconstruct the other part easily anytime, no problem. So even if a part of your DNA gets lost or gets corrupted, the codes get jumbled, the DNA can just look at the other side and repair itself. 
<laughs> it's an amazing algorithm, amazingly efficient algorithm that Allah has put into this DNA. And, and just think about it, you know, scientists claim that some molecules after billions of years of random trial and error have come up with this four letter code that can store an incredible amount of information and then these molecules developed a way to correct themselves if they get corrupted anyway and they uh, come up with a program to even repair themselves. It's all have been done through random trial and error. You know, that's what scientists are claiming. It's, it's incredible that, you know, such an insane claims comes from a good part of the scientific community. Now, about the second amazing thing about DNA, you know, the cell reads the DNA code three letters at a time. So what cells is doing is that cell will read three letters at a time and it will form words. And these words will tell the cell to do something. You know, maybe it will tell the cell, hey, make a protein. Or it will tell the cell, hey, I've got a new virus coming in. Can you make some antivirus for me? Or it will say, hey, fever, pollen has entered body. Go produce mucus. So these are the instructions that cell reads from the DNA and then goes and does something. Now, an interesting thing is that the cell can read the same code from the second letter. You know, first, it can read the code from the first letter, read three letters at a time and get an instruction. The cell can also read the code from the second letter and read three letters at a time and get new instruction. And it can even do the same thing from the third letter, read three letters at a time and get a different set of instruction. The same code gives cell three different instruction. And here's the mind-blogging thing, you know, the, not only cells can read from left to right and get three different instructions from the same code, it can also read the code from backward, from the last letter, read three, read three letters at a time, or the second last letter, read three letters at a time. This way they can get six different instructions from the same DNA code. This is complicated, I understand, you know, many of you have fallen asleep, I, I can see that. You know, the, uh, let me show you the, how incredible it is. Uh, I'll give you an analogy. Imagine you have a book named Stories of the Prophet. If you read every sentence on that book from the first letter, you get the story of Prophet Musa. That's it. If you read every single sentence from the second letter, starting from the second letter, you will get Prophet Ibrahim's story. And if you read the same sentences from the third letter, you will get Prophet Muhammad's story. And imagine a book is like this. There are six different stories stored in one book on the same sentences. You know, that's what is happening in DNA. You get six different, totally different codes. They are all superimposed on each other into one set of text. And that text can be read six different ways to produce six different stories out of it. Imagine you have a book, just one book that you can read six different ways and get six different stories out of it. So that's the genius of Allah. You know, only He can do it. There is no amount of supercomputing power that can produce a million letter length code which will have six different code inside it at the same time. You just have to read from different different positions. That's it. And not only that, DNA gets read different ways in different part of our body. The same code, our liver cell will read one way and do something. Our eye cell will read in one way and do something else. But it's the same code. It's just read different way. To, I mean, to, to give you an analogy, you have the stories of Prophet book. If you read it here, you will get one story. If you go to that room and read it, you will get a different story. That's how incredible DNA is. You know, this is the amount of information has been stored into this amazing code that Allah has put into our cell. This is the Large Hadron Collider, the largest, most complex machine mankind has built so far. And you can see a person standing there it will help you appreciate how big it is. And if you look at the another side of that, you can see how complicated this machine is. I'm showing you this to, to help you appreciate what the most complex machine in the world looks like. Now, this is the most complex machine in the whole universe. And I'm not saying this, you know, this is coming from scientists. Scientists unanimously agree that human brain is the most complex thing in the entire universe. Now, why is that? You know, let's, let's see. You know, we all know that our brains have neurons. Neurons are cells. These neurons are connected with other neurons. Uh, we have about 86 billion neurons on an average in our, in our human brain. Now, what neurons are doing is that they are continuously communicating with each other. Neurons are connected with other neurons 
and they send electrical and chemical signals to each other. And this way neurons communicate with each other, transmit signals from each other. When we are thinking, essentially neurons are firing and, and communicating with each other to carry out our thinking, carry out various body functions that we are doing. So for simplicity, let's assume that whenever you see a flash, one bit of information is transferred from one neuron to another. Now let's do some math how much information our brain processes every second. You know, we have, each neuron can fire 200 times per second, so 200 bits from neuron coming out. A neuron would be connected with on an average 5,000 other neurons. And then we have 10% of our brain active at a time. It, it, by the way, our brain, all the neurons in our brain are not always flashing at the same time. Uh, on an average, 10% of the neurons are active at a time. Now, how much information is getting transmitted? If you multiply 8 billion neurons times 5,000 connection times 200 times per second, you get this staggering 8,000 trillion bits per second. 8,000 terabit of information per second is being transmitted in our brain. Let's put it in context. How large 8,000 terabit is? The entire internet where 22 billion devices are connected, all the computers you have in your homes, universities, schools, offices, all the mobile phones, all the devices that are connected to the internet, in total they transmit about 372, 400 terabits per second. Our brain transmits 8,000 terabits per second. You know, just compare it, it's like how, how big it is, let's see. You know, if you take the earth and you multiply it by 20 earth, if 20 earth had internet in them, the total amount of information that's getting passed in the 20 earth, it will be equivalent to one human brain. Yeah. What an incredible design. And, and scientists have been trying to simulate a brain. And this is a supercomputer. It's the fourth largest supercomputer. It's called K, just K. It has 700,000 processor, which is almost like having 700,000 laptops connected with each other. And they are all working at the same time. That's how powerful you know, a su one supercomputer is. So scientists wrote a code to simulate human brain operation. So researchers from Germany and Japan try to simulate um, what neurons do. So they created artificial neurons and they wrote a program that these artificial neurons would communicate with each other, fire and transmit data with each other. And they ran this program for 40 minutes on this supercomputer. And after running for 40 minutes, they were able to produce 1% of what a human brain does in one second. <laughs> That's what a supercomputer after running a 40 minutes a day, not even like a, a one second of a whole human brain, 1%. So that means that you need 100 of these supercomputers you know, to be run for continuously for 40 minutes to do what a brain does in one second. That's how powerful human brain is. Isn't it? We have this incredibly powerful machine. Now, if you have this 100 supercomputers, how much power you would need? You will need about a gigawatt. Basically, an entire nuclear power station would be needed to run a computer that will do what our brain can do. How much power does our brain need to run? 12 watt. In a light needs 60 watt. Our brain, you know, the most complex machine in the universe, runs at 12 watt. You know, Allah not only created the most powerful thing in the universe, he also created the most power efficient thing in the universe. And that's what human brain is, you know. That's why you have the best form you have this. This 12 watt was really surprising to find. That's it for today's, you know, in the next episode, inshallah, we'll talk about this particular verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 164. Uh, in this verse, Allah is inviting us to look at the uh, creation of the universe and the earth, you know, how days and nights change, how large ships are able to float on the sea carrying huge amount of load, you know, look at water that comes down and revives dead planet, dead earth, and also look at winds and clouds. You know, just in this one verse, you can see that Allah is inviting us to at least six different branches of science. You, know, you have all of these different branches of sciences that Allah is inviting us to reflect on. And inshallah, next time I'll show you that what modern science, these branches of science have discovered about what Allah is inviting us to look at. And what we have found so far is incredible.